This podcast is sponsored by Salesforce.org. Salesforce.org is the dedicated team at Salesforce that delivers technology to non-profits, educational institutions and philanthropic organisations so they can connect with others and do more good. Salesforce.org empowers higher education with Education Cloud, a set of integrated solutions built on the world's number one CRM, developed for the specific needs of the industry and in close collaboration with the community it represents. From building brand awareness, transforming the applicant experience, enhancing student services, building lifelong alumni relationships, or managing change and optimising technology across the campus, Education Cloud supports institutions to drive student success and institutional success at scale. Learn how institutions are paving the way for the future of higher education and driving all kinds of innovations with Education Cloud by visiting the website salesforce.org forward slash higher ed and exploring the higher education customer stories. everyone and welcome to The Edge, supported by Salesforce.org. This series is all about new ways of doing things in higher education leadership. How are you? Did you know we had a whopping 12,731 downloads in January? Thanks so much for listening in, everybody. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us using the hashtag EdTechEdge. Very good point. Can I include some of this chat at the end? You can include whatever you want. (laughs) It's your pod. It's my pod. It is my pod indeed. This week we're talking about university and industry. The relationship between university and industry is complicated. On the one hand, student loan debt in 2020 is now about 1.56 trillion US dollars in the US alone, with graduates described by employers as being overqualified but underskilled. On the other, universities are responsible for some of the most cutting edge research and innovation deployed by industry, and a broad liberal arts education is seen to underpin our best creative and networked problem solvers. Yet too many are outside of this network, and industry calls for diverse thinkers and agile approaches to our biggest societal problems. So, in this episode, we pick apart university and industry, exploring learning economics in an age of perpetual upskilling, the unique strengths of university and industry respectively, and to what extent established universities are limited by how they can evolve with existing regulation and red tape. Back in the autumn last year, I recorded with Graham Brown Martin, a leader in the field of foresight and anticipatory research. He's the author of Learning Reimagined, the best-selling book on global education published by Bloomsbury. To set us up for this episode, here are his musings on the subject of university and industry. Um, But to go back to your point about um, change in industry, so radiology or taxi driving or whatever it might be, how do you see the relationship between that change and how universities are developing as well? What's interesting is there are numbers of universities. Um, So there's the London Interdisciplinary School, Mm -hmm. which, you know, okay, hasn't started yet, but it's very interesting in the sense of, you know, the uh, Marielle, the, the, the director there, is, is, is looking at a degree and saying, well, they have to be interdisciplinary. Because actually, the real world is interdisciplinary, isn't it? I mean, if you're interested in being a surgeon, having some knowledge of computer science might actually be quite useful. Mm. Um, you know, not that you're going to start coding anything, but it's just you're going to be working alongside machines and, and, and so forth. Or you might, there, 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 there will be convergences of things, but, but even if not, you're going to want to collaborate with people from different disciplines. And I think that, you know, we are seeing some universities begin to experiment in that. But the, the, the problem with universities is that they're still, and this is, again, like the music industry and like the textbook industry, you know, they can't change because they're locked into a sort of way of thinking or even a business model. So, mm. you know, universities is interesting, isn't it? Because you'd think a lot of innovation would happen at universities. 
but with a few exceptions, very little innovation happens because there isn't, you know, this sort of monoculture because they silo themselves and they silo, them, silo themselves because it's like, I'm, you know, the history is of citations. Well, I'm not going to share my stuff with you because then, mm. you know, then you might get cited for it and you might steal and so my much idea. funding now is about and, citing. And it's about citations. citations so the yeah. way it's funded. So, so even, you know, I'm not suggesting that, that they're all Machiavellian. I'm just saying just there's, there's perverse consequences. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, the, the, the fighting for tenure, for example... I mean, that, that's a whole part of the thing of working for universities. So there's a whole bunch of things. And there was some talk earlier about the difference between um, hubs of competences versus mm. faculty. And I think that's going to be a disruption in universities. So I think until universities begin to decide, I think that they are going to become less relevant. Um, I mean, to give you a, a simple example, and I won't name the university for a variety of reasons, but so... I have an 18-year-old daughter, and we've been doing the beauty parade of universities. Um, and her interest is, is in filmmaking and writing for film and, and, and television. She's a very good documentarian, as it happens. Um, and so we went, you know, we've been to a number of universities, and, and, and there's been an, over, there's been an overwhelming sort of, sort of doubling down on theory. I mean, one university, for example, they do a four-year film, um, theatre and television degree. And, um, um, you know, we sat through all of that. And I, and I swear, I never do a smart-ass type thing. It, it's, you know, obviously I'm with my daughter, I don't embarrass her. But, you know, we sat there, we listened to, to, the, to you know, we loved the university. It was in a great city and, 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 and you know, it was so far away from home, she just loved the idea. Was you it know, Leeds? I'm not going to mention oh, it. Oh, yeah, so sorry. Thing. I just had um, a guess. Cause it's... <laughs> um, but, but, but then it was fine until we heard from the faculty. And I, I just sat through it. I said, listen, sorry, I, I might have missed it. But are you saying that, that it's a four-year degree and you don't get to make anything until the third year and even then it doesn't count for, for your anything? And she goes, yes, that's what I said. We're not a production course. And she spat the word production out as, as, as it was pejorative. And I'm thinking, you know, so what you're really talking about is a film theory and film history. Yeah, yeah. Th- four-year degree. I'm just thinking, well, what's the point? And, and so, and then we go to the alumni. It's more about they, how to be a film critic, rather. Well, but that, but, that, but that was what it was. So the alumni yeah. were sort of film critics. Yeah. And well, everyone, if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, everyone's a film critic now. You just write a blog. I mean, it's like you don't need to. I don't, I don't need my daughter to come away with a hundred grand in debt. Yeah. To be a film critic, that's not going to work for her. Especially when I can send her to Vancouver Film School for a year. It's going to cost a, a fraction of that, and they guarantee that she'll have a job when she leaves. Now, the point is, is, it's not that she doesn't want to know the theory. She wants mm. to, it's, it's, it's not, it's again, just to clarify, it's not anti-theory, not anti-subject knowledge, not anti-subject mastery. I think all of that is absolute, because how do you know what is true? How do you know what's true? But if you don't apply it to stuff, and I think that comes back to the point, the, the nub of your question, is this, this, this idea of de siloing and making things interdisciplinary. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't we? I mean, it, um, that's not suggesting that you don't go and do a degree in film. But if you do, I mean, imagine if you're doing a degree in film and then we're also working with someone that was doing a degree in quantum physics or someone was doing something in medicine or whatever. I mean, that, that would be interesting for, think, for, I mean, not a waste of time either, not a sort of a frippery. Mm-hmm. They would gain something for each other because the future of work is going to be collaboration and interdisciplinary. And as we know, you know, the jobs that haven't been invented and yada, yada, yada. Um, but so we need to learn how to learn. And we need, to, and we need these, you know, I keep hearing this dreadful term soft skills mm-hmm. you know, to, 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 to describe the things we actually value, you know, mm. like cr- critical thinking, creative thinking, computational thinking and, and, and collaboration and all the C words and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think, you know, it was actually Jan Owen for Australia gave me this term and I, I'm, I'm, I'm down with this. Was, it's their enterprise skills, aren't they? Mm. Because every time you talk to an employer, so back to your point about future radiologists or whatever, you talk to an employer, they all tell you, they want good communicators or they want people who can innovate, people who can think on their feet, people who can collaborate well and all that kind of kind of things. And the, so they're enterprise skills. And how are you going to get those unless you de-silo? One person mentioned in Graham's Reflections is Marielle Vandermeer, Executive Director of Partnerships and Global Networks at LIS or the London Interdisciplinary School. 
Uh, my name is Marielle. I'm originally from the Netherlands, uh, lived in the UK for 15 years, married to a Colombian, worked all over the world, so I always call myself a little bit of a global confusion. Uh, I have been in higher education for the uh, best part of the last 15 years and worked for a number of traditional universities in the Netherlands, in the UK and in the US and uh, got increasingly frustrated, I suppose, with the traditional model of education. And uh, then I started to um, get involved in the more kind of disruptive education space. So uh, I'm currently at the London Interdisciplinary School, but before that I was at Minerva Schools at KGI, which is a university startup based out of San Francisco that recently had its first cohort of graduates. But I was with them for a few years from the very beginning. Um, and then I was involved uh, for a couple of years with the African Leadership University, I was their uh, VP for Global Affairs and then I joined the LAS uh, in July this year as the Executive Director for Partnerships and Global Networks. So my role with LAS is very much focused on building an ecosystem and an infrastructure of partners around, around the university. I caught up with Marielle a few weeks ago to ask what her take was on the current relationship between universities and industry. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think that also ties back to um, my earlier point that I think it's very hard for existing traditional universities to break some of the existing boundaries and barriers that kind of like have been there for centuries. Um, So in my view, it's the newer universities that are much more able to make those connections to what I call the real world and real world organization and the world of work than it is for for some of the more traditional university models. And I think even though it's, it's high on the agenda for traditional universities as well to innovate and to build these linkages with, with, with real world organization, that happens usually just in kind of like in smaller pockets I think it happens it happens on research sometimes it happens at master's level and MBAs obviously but if you look at a a regular undergraduate experience of a regular you know students in a in a in a traditional university here in the UK that happens very very little so I think um, you know Universities in the UK and like worldwide, this is a global phenomenon, uh, are still very much reliant on, um, on, 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 on a number of very, what I call, outdated principles of higher education, which is, first of all, the, the silos of disciplines. Secondly, the fact that education is usually mostly organized around a teacher or a faculty member and not so much student-centered. And then thirdly, very much um, still reliant on standardized methodology of teaching, like lectures, and standardized assessment, like exams. And then in addition to that, it's often the learning happens in a very isolated uh, context without very little connection to, to, to the world of work. And students are don't have a lot of opportunities to actually apply what they're learning in the classroom to the real world until maybe completely at the end of their program or, you know, as, as a bit of a one-off, but not as an integrated, holistic part of their, of their university experience. With this in mind, what is LIS, or the London Interdisciplinary School, aiming to do differently? So we're building a completely new university from scratch. Uh, it is actually my firm belief that it is easier to build a new university from scratch than to try and change something that already exists. Um, and it is roughly um, based on three premises. First of all, that education should be based on problems and not disciplines. Secondly, that education should be porous, in which, with which we mean that it should be connected with the real world and not close up from the real world. And thirdly, that education should be accessible to a broad and diverse range of students and not just to uh, the privileged few. So uh, the model that we're building, the interdisciplinary parts, every every module that a student takes at LAS will be focused on a certain complex problem. So the idea behind it is that education historically and still is very much organized around the silos of disciplines. But obviously the world is not organized in the silos of disciplines. 
disciplines. Uh, knowledge isn't organized in the silos of disciplines. So why should education be? Um, the you know we're living in 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 a very much of a in, in a day and age where knowledge is networked. Uh, so it's connected, and information is just a click of the finger away. So what if you instead of educating students in a certain discipline, what if you educate them um, with a capacity to solve certain complex problem and draw connections and to transfer knowledge between domains. Uh, so um, every module is centered around one core problem. Students look at that problem through the lenses of multiple disciplines and also use uh, different research methodology to actually tackle that problem. Then secondly, as I said, uh, we believe that education should be porous. So we very much work in close collaboration with partner organizations in um, different um, different industries and sectors. We bring those organizations into the curriculum. So some of the curriculum is actually designed together with some of these partner organizations that bring a certain complex problem to us um, and that also bring their expertise to us. Students also do an actual work placement at the end of each year. So during the the course of their three-year undergraduate degree, they'll have a very broad um, understanding, they'll develop a very broad understanding of the world of work, of certain complex problems that are there in the world of work, they will build their network, they'll build their experience as well. And then the third piece um, around admissions, um, we have a very different admissions approach than other universities in the UK, uh, so we have what we call a contextual admissions approach where we don't, well we do look at academic grades and achievements, but only within the context of the background of the student. So if a student goes, we look at the school that the student goes to, we look at what their parental income is, we look at is the student on free school meals, any kind of like contextual background elements that shape shape the student um, and that shape the context of that student and then we invite every student to an, um, a selection day at the university where they'll be interviewed and uh, do a series of, of, of assessments that are quite holistic so I think those are the, the three core elements of what we're building at, at LAS to break through some of the kind of the status quo of what's happening currently in traditional models of education. Another person rethinking the relationship between university and industry is Rachel Coulson. I'm a former synchronized swimmer, and uh, I'm not in a pool enough these days, so I've translated that love for choreographed movement into uh, planning lots of flash mobs whenever I can, including ones for my friends' weddings and one at Guild that we had yesterday. Alongside synchronised swimming and flash mobs, Rachel is the CEO and co-founder of Guild Education and recently joined the ranks of female founders leading a company of unicorn stature. That is to say, a privately held startup company valued at over $1 billion. At a time when 89% of all venture capital deals go to companies led by a male CEO, I particularly cherish the Fast Company article on her success entitled how I landed a 40 million US dollar investment just days before I delivered twins. A bit of background. Rachel formerly worked on the 2008 Obama campaign before transitioning to a role in the administration. She left the White House to attend Stanford Graduate School of Business, where upon graduating, she worked in associate and finance roles before founding her first company, Student Blueprint an edtech startup that provided college students and schools with academic and career planning tools. Then, in June 2015, Rachel co-founded her second company, Guild Education, with Brittany Stitch. So, what are Guild trying to do when it comes to university and industry? A quick intro. Guild helps employers offer higher education as a company benefit to their frontline employees. The organisation works to unlock opportunity for the 88 million Americans who are in need of education and reskilling in order to compete in the future of work. So think of Fortune 1000 companies like Walmart, the Walt Disney Company and Chipotle um, and Guild are partnering with those organisations to help their employees go back to school in partnership with leading non-profit universities. Here's Rachel's take on the current status of university and industry and why people are getting so excited about the education as a benefit business model. So I'd say two key trends to highlight. The first one is that for a long time, we've assumed that universities are the decider of what we teach and how we teach. 
uh, but we're moving into an era where that what question, what are the skills for the future of work, what are the in-demand jobs, what should we be preparing people for, is more often answered by the industry or the enterprise than the higher ed entity. Meanwhile, we should be maximizing the how, the, the curricular, the instructional, the, the pedagogical questions within our universities, which is what they're best at. So I think it's a shift from letting universities answer both the what and the how to instead asking industry to be a partner in defining the what. Um, so I think that's a, that's a key trend. I think the second important trend is uh, diversifying this benefit such that it can be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And where that starts for me is that the core tuition reimbursement model, which most companies have relied on for two to four decades as it relates to education benefits, is you know inherently discriminatory in that you had to be able to front you know five thousand dollars to go back to school meanwhile waiting for your company to pay you back at the end of the semester and and i like to say you know imagine if our health care benefits worked that way you know we have a, a couple moms here at guild who recently gave birth imagine if i had told them hey go to the hospital pay for whatever it costs and then hey in december of next year we'll, we'll refund you i mean that would be bonkers um but we've somehow let education benefits lag in an antiquated model meanwhile we've brought all of our other benefits like healthcare and 401k and learning and development and other employee experiences into the 21st century. And so we think an important trend is, is we're bringing with our software platform and our technology, which we're the, the only ones in the market who've been able to do this, we're bringing new and innovative ways for industry to relate to higher ed and, and by building our marketplace of, of learning providers and universities and connecting companies and their employees to that wide variety of schools, but all in a way that doesn't require the employee to front the money. What is it you think uh, about the education as a benefit model, which is so exciting to both investors and users at the moment? Sure. So, you know, we're, we're very excited that we just raised a recent round of funding with General Catalyst and, and brought their chairman, uh, Ken Chenault, onto the board. Um, and I, I think Ken saw in us what, what we have believed about ourselves and are excited to be proving out, which is we're at this unique time in history where CEOs are uniquely capable of driving social change around the world. And, and that's in their communities and their companies, but most importantly for their own employees. And I think in, pri in, in prior decades, many companies were looking outward on their social impact and only thinking about it from a charitable perspective. But now companies are thinking more thoughtfully about double bottom lines, which we're, we're passionate about as a B Corp, and thinking, how do we create an opportunity to support our employees while supporting our, our bottom line. And so that's a key premise behind what we're doing with Guild, which is helping unlock opportunity for the workforce while providing a, a valuable experience uh, for the employee to go back to school. Meanwhile, creating value for the company in terms of improving their recruitment and their retention, their, their upskilling and promotion agendas, uh, and their, their brand as an employer. So we think that's, that's the crux of, of why this moment is so important. I'd also say on the other side, B2C acquisition channels for higher education have never been crazier. And, and in the duopoly that is Google and Facebook, far, far too much of the student debt crisis has ultimately landed in the pocketbooks of Google and Facebook shareholders. And it's time we think differently about funding education and how do we cut the, the dollars out of non-value added services like marketing and, and instead direct them towards what our students need most, which is support, coaching, technology, instruction, and, and ultimately high quality programs that, that are, accommodate their life as a working adult learner. I think Rachel's take on the university specialism of pedagogical practice versus content delivery is exciting, valuing as it does the specific teaching expertise of the university institution. This puts an end to the trope on the Uberization of teaching or the Netflix of education. Teaching and learning is so much more than consuming content. And we've seen some of the kind of tech ventures that have tried to um, perhaps replace teachers in that way without and without due regard for the pedagogy and now millions of pounds of investment down the line their plans have sometimes faltered and that kind of idea of bit like uberizing education isn't working so it is more complex so 
Um, it, it's, it's this idea that what you're trying to disrupt is teaching. What you're trying to do, you know, what, what the, the problem is we don't have enough teachers. Oh, I know, we'll replace them with an AI. Hmm. Well, that just means you just don't understand teaching. G- good teachers use a repertoire. They don't just use I mean, sometimes you need instruction. Mm-hmm. But also, it's that sometimes you need, right, to go off and then try and, you know, because if it's just instruction and that's all you do, how do you know that you've learned? How do you, where do you get transference where you move that to something else? Where do you get to, a chance to tinker with that little bit of knowledge? So, perhaps the new relationships between university and industry are about understanding better where their relative strengths and weaknesses lie. Gosh, one thing that people don't know. Um, I would say that most people wouldn't know that I'm currently trying to write a a, a book, a a novel at the moment um, in the science fiction genre, uh, which I'm hoping, if I can stretch my time enough, that I will complete and uh, publish at the end of this year. That's Anthony Tattersall, Senior Director of Enterprise for EMEA at Coursera. Here he talks to me about the benefits of tying together industry and university through online learning and data insights. So welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to you know, make you sort of do that cringy thing of sitting and listening <laughs> to some description about your work. And please feel free to jump in if any of it is... Uh, Factually incorrect, but I I shall give it a shot. So um, Coursera is an American online learning platform founded in 2012 by Stanford professors Andrew Ng and Daphne Kuller that offers massive open online courses or MOOCs, as we like to call them, specializations and degrees. Um, Scale wise, so Coursera is used by more than 45 million learners worldwide, 1.3 million of which are from the UK. And it allows anyone from anywhere to learn and earn credentials from the world's top universities and education providers. And in terms of working with upskilling employees, there are currently 2,000 companies using Coursera to upskill their employees, 60 of which are Fortune 500 companies. Um, And just finally, um, Anthony joined Coursera, I believe, at the start of 2019 and has more than 20 years of technology and corporate learning experience. His primary primary focus is adding value to Coursera's UK and European customers and helping them to build a culture of learning to transform the skills of their employees to face the challenges of a rapidly changing world. The real value of Coursera comes from its global scale and the data that we have. When you have a subscriber base of 47 million people, we have like 2,000 direct customers, but we probably have representation of more like 7,000 customers um, because a lot of people um, come onto the, if you like, the consumer side of the platform with a corporate email address. And we get to see what are they learning, what are the roles that they're doing today, at what level of mastery. And then we, from this, we can give a global perspective of what are the most important skills trends that the world is focused on today? How do those differ, differ by geography and by mm. industry? And what should you as an organization be focused on, or at least what are your peers focused on within your industry, within your geography? Um, so you have a view, you don't know what the future skills are, at least you know what everybody else is focused on. And we can give you some very, very strong guidance on that. The second thing we can do from that is we can actually help organizations figure out that when their their learners are engaging with our content, what are the skills that are actually being developed by engaging with that content? And at what level of expertise have they developed those skills? Because we have all of our content will have assessments built in to test your learning capability. And we have something like about 80 million question attempts a year on our platform which gives, again, us a huge data set to actually say that, well, based on the way you conducted those assessments and how many times you was completed, the way you answered those questions, you're a beginner, you're an intermediate, you're an expert in this particular skill set, which then helps organizations really understand not just the skills they have in the organization, but how strong those skills are and who they should put on what projects and how best to utilize their, their workers across the workforce. And that all those kind of capability sets only really come from having to have a globally available platform with a huge amount of data that just doesn't come from a kind of bricks and mortar type environment. Part of this is about the learning economics of corporations reskilling and upskilling, changing in favour of retention over constant recruitment. Anthony from Coursera again. 
now are you seeing more companies say okay it's more our responsibility to retain our current employees and where there are gaps we're just actually going to accept that there will be continual learning that's necessary so i think a few things on that so i think first of all you, you know that assessment of corporates being able to evaluate the value of learning um is, is completely correct right and a lot of organizations really do struggle with how you actually quantify um learning outcomes um and the and we spend a lot of time working with organizations helping them do exactly that and there are very clear tangible hard cash benefits that mm. come from investing and learning and it's very straightforward to actually um you know baseline where you are and to and showcase how that's being delivered particularly around things like retention you can look at you know how many people are leaving your organization and what are the reasons for them leaving and if those reasons are around lack of development opportunity lack of internal career mobility and then you give them investments in those areas and you see a change in the numbers it's very mm. easy to calculate that benefit Similarly, you can look at how many roles do you have open as an organization and how many of those roles have you managed to fill through internal hires that you've invested in developing the skill set to allow them to take on that role. And that very, very quickly generates real hard savings because it's quite expensive to hire people. Um, and your, your earlier point about you know, people just used to kind of like let people go and then replace them with different skill sets if it was needed. I think that that was true, but it's starting to change because the the skills requirements are now changing so quickly mm. that the costs of hire and fire now far outweigh the costs of reskilling by probably about six to one. So it gets gets really expensive really quickly, and it, it builds a terrible morale if you're constantly churning your staff. You can't build culture. You don't build um, that constant expertise as productivity impacts and so on. So I think more and more organisations are now recognising that reskilling is a key thing. But part of this is also about understanding what face-to-face experiences can bring wherever they may take place. Yeah, uh, I'm Hendrik Freeman and I worked as the president for the last three years here on IHM Business School in Sweden. Uh, I have a private background from the high-tech industry and the research mm-hmm. arena within the international assignments from innovation and digitalization. In terms of curriculum design and, and, and that fast pace of change that we talked about um, with business and technology moving so quickly, um, how does the business school go about integrating what the business sector requires back into your own kind of programs of learning? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, we have an um, education principle where we strongly believe that the meeting between professional is an important part for the learning curve. So having face-to-face or techniques that helps you to be really near in that discussion to get deeper, not just having something that are presented to you, but getting deeper into the details of what you are trying to learn. That's an important part of the education approach that we are working with. So the technology sides that we have done so far is what we call blended learning, meaning that using technologies to get you up to speed. So when you have those meetings, they are really, really intensive and and value for you to actually spend that time out of your office to be in a classroom. And also between the different meetings, you have... Uh, reports back from what happened on the last, you have exam, you have homework between them, assignments. So you're working on and off during a time period to get the best results that are sustainable for a longer time. Uh, And that's different. I mean, if you go on an e-learning program or even if you just go on YouTube and just see a good movie Mm. or good brief, that doesn't give you this deeper insight that a classroom could give. This episode is called University and Industry, What's Next? So what would be your take on that title? Uh, I think it's a really important question you are addressing here. If you look on the strongest trends that's happening at the moment in our society, it's the change of the working force. 
So the workforce of the future is a really important trend shift that we are spotting and, and also working with. And also the lifelong learning approach. And lifelong learning is not, nothing new, but the way we are looking on lifelong learning with reskill and upskills mm. makes a huge challenge for both universities and company in the future. So, uh, for example, if you look on the workforce of the future, you're going to see that you're going to be more and more free moving between jobs. You're going to see people also working in other formats that traditionally been done before and from places you never dreamed of before. If you're looking on the learning then is that you're actually moving over the responsibilities for being on the edge and being your best, moving over from company that used to have the, the strong incentives to actually create the best workforce, to instead being on the individual level where the person needs to be best to be employed. Mm-hmm. So uh, you could see a lot of shift in the learning part. If you wa- walk over to lifelong learning, you could see it's an assumption that the learning is taking place in the school systems, in university and other schools. But if you ask yourself, if you're learning through the life, where is actually the learning taking place? Part of it will be in the school system. That's uh, that's for sure. But a lot of the learning will actually take place on other places. Uh, I... I asked my, one of my directors when we worked with a lifelong learning approach on our school, and he just said that I'm moving from jobs when I need to learn a lot more, mm. which means that a lot of the learning actually takes place outside the classrooms. So that's going to shift the way we're looking on university and education system in the future. Indeed, the workplace where we spend so much of our time offers such opportunity for positive change. For this, a learning culture must be embraced and shared. I think the other thing which we're starting to see is that there are a lot of organisations now actually see education, um, that they have a part to play in the world's education. And this is something Coursera is very passionate about. The, The original kind of foundation of the company was to enable people anywhere in the world to access the world's leading content from the greatest universities in the world. And all they need to have is an internet connection. Um, and you only really pay you actually want a certificate, but otherwise that, that learning is effectively freely available. And there was a real strong view that, that if you can solve for education, you can make a huge, huge difference in the world and people and everything else. And what we're starting to see now as we work with universities, as we work with our uh, industry partners who provide content on the platform, as we work with uh, 47 million people on our platform um, who are individually trying to improve their skill sets, and we work with governments who are trying to deploy Coursera to their citizens, and we work with large-scale companies, Mm. a lot of these corporate organizations, while recognizing the value of investing in learning for themselves, are also looking at how can learning be delivered almost as a sort of CSR initiative, as a corporate social responsibility or a social good? Mm. And so we see people developing programs like how do we get more women's, women in technology? How do we get more people in technology uh, into leadership positions? How do we actually get people in from uh, other, t- other territories in the world where people may not have access to the same standards of education? Uh, how do we get people in perhaps with the same language skills or don't have the same life chances of the people but have done amazing things given their circumstances? How do we reflect that and then actually give them the opportunity to really contribute? And so education, I think, has the ability to be such a powerful force for good that I think we're seeing now more companies recognize not just the benefits, benefits but the kind of branded equity value that comes from being an organization that is seen to be a real uh, focal point for both being an internal developer of skills and actually offering some kind of learning capability to people outside of their business as a sort of social good exercise. And that's, and that's actually really an exciting thing to see starting to happen. Our, our, our core product will be the undergraduate program, but we are simultaneously also developing some professional development training programs um, for for companies. Uh, we'd always had that in mind. I, I'm a f- 
I'm a firm believer in learning on a continuum. Uh, I don't think learning should happen in kind of like boxes of, of age groups, etc. Et, et especially not now in this day and age. And and obviously, you know, you can read any report, you know, whether it's WEF or, or whatever. It, it it always talks about that one of the best, one of the most important skills that people can have now is the ability to learn and to keep learning and to learn on the workplace. Um, so I think learning should happen in a continuum. And I do believe that there's a huge potential for universities to, as you say, capitalize on the need from within organization to um, retrain their staff or to give their staff the tools to keep on learning. Um, it doesn't have to be as radical as, as retraining completely uh, or reskilling. Um, and I think in the US, for instance, a lot of universities are already very much tapping into that market of, of continuous learning or lifelong learning or whatever we, you know, we want to call it. But here in the UK, it's, it still kind of like happens in isolation. Uh, so I, I definitely think there's a, there's a huge potential there. But it's not really happening as far as I can see. I'm not an expert in that per se, but it, it's not happening very holistically uh, right now. I mean, we do have to market it and push it consistently. And so organizations that we work with, some of them will run like, run like you know, learning version of Olympic Games. Others will do like a curiosity quarter or a learning week or a yeah. roadshow or webinars to kind of spike people's interest and show them what's available. And we tend to find it works most powerfully if you have a real C-level um, sponsorship of learning. So Novartis were fantastic at basically having everyone from the CEO down sharing, these are the courses I'm doing. This is my playlist. This is the, 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 the learning program I'm, I'm engaging with. And then having all of those C-suite people say, look, from my department, these are the courses I recommend and cascading that down from the management levels. If you really have that leadership focus and genuine, obvious belief that learning matters and they're driving from the top down, then you get a much more stronger um, feeling that from employees that, this really is a learning-based culture, and I want to be part of that and want to develop my skill sets in the same way. And I'm getting guidance about how best to do that in a way that would be meaningful for me in my particular role and what the company is looking to achieve in the future. And what you then tend to see happening is that individuals who have been given this, and you can see that with many, many companies on LinkedIn, is that employees will then actually say, uh, be publishing on LinkedIn their Coursera certificate and say, hey, I've just, just completed this course, I've got my certificate, and you know they're publishing as, as an employee of the company that's allowed them to do that. So it then creates this almost social media platform where employees are publicizing that this company I'm working for invests significantly in my learning and has a huge potential brand impact for both attraction and retention of staff. With new models weaving together university and industry, everything from the typical student undergraduate to employer pipeline to curriculum design is being challenged. Are you seeing this mostly at the moment geared towards sort of undergrad students or also mid-career students that need to sort of reskill and go back into uh, college or university? We're seeing all use cases. You know, we have folks in their 50s and 60s who are earning their high school credential, believe it or not. They had to drop out of high school to work and help support their families. Uh, or they're immigrants to the U.S. and never had a chance to complete the program in their native country. Um, then we're seeing, you know, folks in their 20s who tried community college and didn't have a successful experience or didn't have the money to pay for school and are now re-entering to complete a bachelor's degree program. And then we've got a wide variety of folks who actually have uh, associates or bachelors or, or maybe don't have a degree at all, but are instead earning certificates and credentials mm -hmm. that are targeted towards specific skills-based roles like the trades, plumbing, electrical, uh, as well as things like data analytics, digital marketing, uh, software engineering, you name it. I speak to two type of, of, of individuals within organizations. I speak to kind of CEOs and, and um, uh, kind of more senior managers in an organization, but I also speak a lot to HR managers and HR directors that are really identifying a number of struggles that they're having when they're hiring graduates um, in terms of, you know, the skills gap that everyone always talks about, but it's a real thing. It's a real phenomenon. And, um, and, and the disconnect between, you know, what, what students are learning in a classroom and what they're looking for retaining staff, staff retention is a, is, is, is a huge issue as well. So the idea of the, the graduate that will come out of LAS, that is a polymath, that is a student that will um, understand 
how to solve complex problems that will uh, understand technology and understand how to use it and not afraid to use it, that will be comfortable with data and knows how to analyze data. And that on top of that also has developed a certain set of human skills that are so important uh, that know, you know, that know how people act and do and do what they do and, and why they love and hate and, and make certain decisions. I think that's the type of graduate that a lot of employers are looking for and um, it's. I'm not saying that those graduates aren't out there because of course they are but it's hard to to choose from a pile of CVs that you're getting from let's say seven, I think 70% of students from UK universities graduate with a 2-1 and of that, you know, about 80% graduate within a single discipline. So, so how, does, how, how does an HR manager choose a gradu- one graduate over another? Uh, it's very hard to do. And you have very little benchmarks to, to assess what that, what that person can actually contribute to the organization. And I was interested, when you, when you mentioned I think you have sort of several thousand students, um, how many of them are sort of uh, typical undergrads and how many of them are say perhaps more uh, mid-career workers that are, are looking to reskill and I suppose those ones might fall into your business yeah. um, that you work with as well. Yeah now that's the executive education part and it, it's about 850 to 1,000 people it's through the years it's over 50,000 people that gone through our education system as mid-career people or executive education so uh, every year it's a, almost 1000 people that we can uh, we can serve during the year uh, and most of them coming here because they are looking for e- either upskill to take higher positions in their companies or other companies or reskill to actually get to the job they dream to do and with all this data flying around what can we learn about what learning is in demand and where it tends to be really tied to the company strategy. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the core strategy of the corporation we're partnered with, asking lots of questions of their learning and development team, their uh, line of business operators, and understanding where do they want their talent acquisition strategy or their talent retention or talent promotion strategy to connect back to this benefit. And it looks different. There are companies that I'll call a, a a triangle model, a pyramid, if you will, where they have lots of upward movement for their frontline employees, in which case they want this benefit to tie to promotion pathways. Mm -hmm. There are other companies who are looking at their pyramid today and seeing it get flatter and flatter and flatter, such that there's millions of entry wage jobs, but not nearly as many middle skill jobs. And they're saying, how might we help our workers retain with us? today and learn and then move on to another career or another company. Uh, And they're still finding a positive ROI in doing that by by having the employee retain while they go back to school for three, four, five years. So it really varies in terms of the skills and the core strategy of the company, but we're delighted that we found high quality academic partners to serve all those needs. And roughly speaking, what percentage of Coursera's revenue comes from the enterprise sector? So um, it's 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 hard to quantify that specifically because Coursera has so many different elements of the business and it's kind of crossovers. Mm. But what I can tell you is that it's a hugely growing revenue line um, within Coursera, um, and uh, we grew about a hundred percent year over year last year and in the previous year. And again, we're anticipating very very fast growth um, this year. Uh, so it's uh, it's a hugely growing space and. I think from our perspective as a business, because we are so strongly focused on transformational outcomes, it's very much in the world of skills development. You know, we help people figure out uh, what are the skills they want to develop, how are they progressing against those skills development goal goals to the state they want to get to, um, how does that need to change over time? And we have a huge amount of reporting capabilities to help them do that. And so. We're, we're very strongly linked with business outcomes, mm-hmm. which means that the value that we can deliver in the context of what we do is more than just providing content. It's really providing a program that helps an organization reskill itself to be competitive in the future. And that's driven a lot of the interest in Coursera and a lot of the revenue growth of the business. 
And, and on that basis, um, you know, what are some of the most popular courses that you found within the enterprise side of the business? And um, what types of qualifications or credentials are employees gaining when they are going for the sort of full credentials as well? So the, there's an interesting thing about popularity because I think if you look at sort of more the technical consumers, um, people looking at kind of computer science and data science skills, because the underlying technologies they're working on change so fast, mm. they tend to consume a lot of content and a lot That's of training programs. Yeah. And so where we see the most um, usage will be in things like data science and computer science at sort of a high level. Um, and you know, data science is something that Coursera is widely recognized as being incredibly strong. We have an amazing set of data science capabilities. We have an entire data science academy that we can help um, organizations build from data literacy up into real mastery of skill sets. Um, and so that's a very, very strong area of focus for us. And then I would say broadly, we also have a big component around business, around leadership skills, and what I would call some of the real critical power skills. You know, the ability to engage with cross-functional teams, to have sort of design thinking approaches, to be entrepreneurial within, within business units, to think about how to run a digital oriented team or manage a digital transformation project or manage um, a, you know, very um, internationally dispersed organizations. All these kind of leadership skills um, that now have to account for the fact that organizations are becoming much, much more data-driven, much more diverse, much more um, transformed using digital technology, um, also go through into kind of the softer skills and the business leadership skills. So those tend to be the really core areas. And then within that, we tend to see certain courses will be really, really popular. Um, so we have things like learning how to learn is one of the, the most popular courses on our platform. Um, uh, and we have things such as like you know finance for non-professionals or um, you know AI for everyone, uh, which is actually written by our founder, um, which is a hugely popular course um, because most organisations are starting to recognise now that everybody has to have a basic level of understanding of what data is, what data science is all about, what AI means for business or machine learning, um, what digital and digital transformation is, and so where you have courses that will actually develop a, a kind of a universal understanding for the entire population of the organization, it kind of naturally applies to every single employee that they have that formal foundation of knowledge, and then they will specialize then a little bit more deeply from that point onwards. Um, Python is also a hugely popular area um, of programming capability. Um, that we have in our catalog as well. So we, we do see different dimensions of courses, but it does tend to be around Data, data, data science transformation um, that are really the kind of core drivers within like a business leadership and kind of power soft skills uh, wrapper on it. It's a quite traditional uh, business school. Uh, if you look on, on the programs, you're going to find management, leadership, you're going to find finance, you're going to see on project leading, business intelligence, business development. So you have all the, the traditional ways. We also have quite a lot on the digital side, like digital analytics, um, going into to marketing on the digitalization on marketing. So the, the foundation of the school used to be in marketing, but mm. today we are focusing on the whole business area. And I mean, it's quite interesting um, just to go back. I think, you know, some of your customers are in the Fortune 500 companies. Um, I just mm -hmm. wondered if you could tell us a little bit about who some of your corporate customers are and also how they are going about, you know, interacting and using Coursera. So we have, um, I mean, my, my uh, remit um, for Coursera is to run what we call our European, Middle East and Africa region. Um, and we have customers uh, across that territory in the UK and Germany and France, the Nordics, the Middle East, South Africa, etc. cetera. Um, and the ones I think that are kind of doing things on a really large scale um, probably the best example of that would be Novartis, um, who uh, put a lot of publicity out recently about their engagement with Coursera um, and are really looking to drive um, the kind of core outcomes from learning that I think most organizations would want to achieve if they really focus on what I would call transformational learning. And when I talk about transformational learning, I would say a lot of learning providers are providing what we call bite-sized or short-form content which is really, you know, it's videos and things that are typically a few minutes in length, maybe an hour long, 
uh, mm. which will often help people do what they're doing within their current role. You know, I need to put an Excel pivot table together. I need to figure out how to do that. I'll, I'll download the video. I'll watch that. Um, but they don't really, you can't really create a completely new skill set from watching an hour video. If you want to take someone from uh, sort of a, a graduate starting position and turn them into a data scientist, then it's a lot more intense level of learning and training and application of that knowledge and the utilization of projects to test and apply it in a real world scenario that needs to go into that kind of skills development world. And that's where Coursera is very much focused. We're very much focused in transformational. So it's helping employees develop skills they didn't have uh, or significantly enhancing their skills. So if you look at an organization like Novartis, um, who's now working with Coursera globally across their business, 110,000 employees, they're really trying to drive improvements in retention by being the kind of go-to organization in Europe for having a learning culture where you can develop your skills. Try to improve internal mobility and career development outcomes for their employees, um, recognizing that there are some roles in the marketplace, particularly those around data science and some of the uh, advanced tech and data skills, which are really hard to acquire because there just aren't enough people out there with those skill sets and everybody's looking for the same thing is actually far more effective than to try and grow those skills in-house and reskill people, particularly those whose roles may be disappearing in the near future, um, and actually get them into, into new functions. So, so driving internal mobility through skills development and Coursera, and then ultimately driving better business outcomes. And business outcomes uh, can be affected in numerous different ways depending on what's important to the business, but it's if you, if you recognize that having a better set of skills or a more aligned skills with what you need to achieve as a business in the future, then those things will typically lead to uh, improved customer service, improved productivity, greater innovation, um, improvements in supply chain optimization, time to market for new products, ultimately revenue and improved margins and better, better competitive outcomes in a global market that is now very susceptible to be disrupted by new startups. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what Novartis is focused on. And they're already seeing that coming through in that they're seeing changes in the amount of people that are applying to the business. And some of the reasons why they're wanting to join Novartis is coming through more strongly in the sense that they're recognizing it's such a fantastic learning culture. And Novartis has also um, gone beyond this um, and has also launched a global program now to offer uh, online degrees to its employees um, in the areas of data science in partnership with Coursera. Um, so it's really looking at um, in depth how they can take people from a fairly foundational learning need where you're looking at basic skills mm -hmm. into some deep levels of mastery around specific domains and then into actual full online degree programs where you deliver, deliver real expertise in core subject areas that they feel are important to their business. As we near the end of this episode, it's important to be clear, not all university is about employment, industry and economically derived value. People attend university for very different reasons. But with industry smarting from the rapid pace of technological change, skills deficiencies and societal problems, university has an important role. How will it step up to this challenge? I'm sure we'll see more education as a benefit models popping up. But more importantly, will the regulation of universities allow existing universities to go at the speed they wish? So we are slightly delayed uh, because of uh, the, the regulatory process. It's obviously, and it should be a long process to actually get accreditation as a new university. So um, it's absolutely understandable that that takes, takes a little bit, bit of time. So we're working with the Office for Students and the QAA to get uh, registration and to get um, uh, accreditation and degree awarding power. That is all going a little bit slower than we initially anticipated. I think we were overly optimistic, possibly, and uh, um, uh, kind of um, didn't realize the, the, the length of the bureaucracy and the, the process. So we've now decided just before Christmas actually had to make the decision to postpone our uh, launch date until September 2021. We had, or, however, already started to uh, receive applications. So we our application 
um, application form is uh, not we're not we're not on UCAS, so we had our own application form. We had that open for about two months and received 800 applications, which is uh, fantastic. But we did have to go to all those 800 students and tell them, like, sorry, we're not quite ready to start yet. But one of the reasons why, like, in principle, one could open without um, registration and validation. But what that means is that if you're not registered with, a, with the Office for Students, with the OFS, that means that students cannot take out a student loan. And since we have such a strong commitment to, to widening participation and to diversity, that was just not something that we could, that we could consider. To wrap up this episode, I asked my guests about the things that have inspired them when they think about university and industry. Uh, so the Global Skills Index is effectively uh, a report on uh, across across the globe of, of uh, looking at both uh, individual industries and geographies about where we see the strength of those skill sets. And there is a new version that will be coming out fairly soon. Um, so this will be updated further. Um, but from that, you can sort of see where there are challenges uh, in different industries. You'll find that there are certain organizations um, that will be stronger in certain technical skills than others. There's a real, um, I think, uh, if you look at Europe as a whole, like, and I'll also say within the UK, there's a general falling behind in things like AI skills and some of the digital mm. skills compared to perhaps the US or China. Um, you'll look at certain t- industries, like certain geographies in Europe, so the Nordics tend to be quite quite advanced in some of these skill sets. Some of the sort of mainland European ones seem to be a little bit further behind. And then if you look at individual industries, you'll see very different profiles of skills, sometimes based on what's important um, uh, to them. But a lot of, say, financial services organizations are behind on some of the core technical skills, um, perhaps compared to other industries, where they'll perhaps need to play a catch-up. And so there's a huge amount of detail in this report. It's obviously it's like an 80-page report which goes into a lot of detail on the regions. Um, but what we can, what we tend to do with that when we're talking with organisations, it helps them understand, you know, where their organisation resides in terms of the general pattern and trends within their geography, but also how they stack up globally and then within their industry sector and against other industries that they may see as kind of you know ancillary or competitive in some way. Um, and, and from that, they can also then use that data to help them understand their own skills profile and are they likely to be you know, underperforming or kind of emerging or are they actually cutting edge in some of their skill sets, which they can then leverage to be much more effective on the kind of global stage. One thing that uh, springs to mind because I've recently been thinking about it is that, um, and especially when I was working at the African Leadership University, which essentially has as its mission to educate 3 million African leaders in, in the next 25 years, because obviously the continent of Africa um, it has a huge, it's, it's, it's the fastest growing population in the world and the fastest growing young population, yes, had, yet has the lowest tertiary education rate. So how do you, you're sitting on a, on a potential ticking tie bomb, so how do you make that into something positive rather than something um, that could be a potential disaster so what what you know what we what we use the analogy we used a lot there and which was which was helpful was the idea of a moonshot so the idea of moonshot thinking and when JFK s- decided to put men on the moon in 1962 he said something along the lines of we're not doing it because it's easy but precisely because it's hard so it's about doing hard things and about um, you know a moonshot is about trying to find a solution to a problem that seems impossible to solve uh, by finding some sort of radical solution to it and oftentimes it's a um, an opportunity that's disguised as an impossible situation and I like to think that building new universities is about that it's it's about that opportunity that you have but it's uh, it's it's often kind of like you know completely hidden behind all the challenges that 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 surround it so so that would probably be something that inspires me the, the idea of the moonshot and and never be afraid of that and it's a little bit like climbing a mountain if you if you start climbing a mountain you don't really see the top I think if you would see the top you probably never climb it because it looks too too overwhelming and too daunting so you kind of keep going and the road isn't going straight it's kind of like you know meandering around and then you don't realize how far you already come until you start looking down and see the distance that you've taken so so i think that's that's something that keeps me going that that thought and that also something that you know makes me never stop and and never question that what we're doing is possible there are so many so many 
interesting things that are going on on the market at the moment. So you, I mean, everywhere you can find inspiration and perspective what we're doing. But one of the things that I think it's really important is the work that is done by the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering and Science. And they are running projects today to look on what skill sets and, and learning that are needed in the, in the coming society. Uh, you also have a famous professor, Shell Nordstrom. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of, uh, of him. He's an author of Funky Business and Urban Express. And he talks quite a lot of the deglobalization trends. Mm. So why should you go global when the best business of most companies are local? Uh, that's a quite interesting part, especially when you look on university, because most of the universities today are actually investing to go global. Hmm. So uh, it's an interesting trend and so insights that I think it's value for, for our business. And of course, one of my favorite books is uh, if Mark Pay, uh, How to Kill a Unicorn, when you actually can bring innovation and products into successful ideas that goes to the market. Um, if you haven't read that, it's really a good book for the summer. Um, what people, projects, books, or other resources have inspired you so that you, you know, things that you'd like to share with our listeners that you tend to go back to on this journey? Oh, sure. Uh, that's a fun question. I guess, well, over the holidays, I started rereading some of Brene Brown's work, which I had a chance to learn and read in business school. So I, I guess that one's right, right on the list. Um, you know, I like reading about other tangential sectors that are solving similar but distinct problems. So one of my favorite books is The End of June, which deconstructs the American foster care system and all of its challenges in, in a really thoughtful way. Um, and then, you know, in terms of people, I think that's probably the place I learned most. I, we've been so fortunate to have a network, or I call it my kitchen cabinet, of folks who, who I keep on speed dial. Um, and, and many of them have been in the Guild ecosystem. Some of them, like Josh Scott, was our advisor and then a Guild board member. And now he actually works here full time as our president. Um, and, then, and then my board, uh, the, the, bo the Guild board of directors and, and the old the folks who've been with me the whole time, like Michael Deering, as well as new folks like Ken Chenault, who recently joined, those are the folks that keep on speed dial, and, and they're my my favorite thought partners. Um, and so I I guess I I like a mix of people and books to to build my knowledge set. And some conclusions from Henrik. And I mean the old education system. You used to have the magist magister in the classroom, and you used to have the master down as the craftsman. So, I mean, we used to have a society where you could actually have a career on a practical side and you could have one on a theoretical side. So, it's coming back. It's coming back, yeah. We, we normally go back and say the proof is in the pudding. Look <laughs> on who's, who's been on a IHM. I mean, we have 50,000, over 50,000 people within the Swedish society that has an exam from our school. And if you look on what position they have today, can't be wrong they're doing all right <laughs> <laughs> they are doing i mean if you take 3m the big corporation mm. the ceo and, and the chairman there is actually a, a former alumni to ichan fantastic yeah so the proof is in the pudding indeed yeah that's true <laughs> now start to think with data mm. begin from the data i mean if you look if you're focusing on the balance sheet or just the equations within in uh, finance that's not good enough today it's actually the data that has the biggest value in the company and when you educate people for business and they don't think on data they think about balance sheets you are probably going to focus on the wrong sources in the future good point. what's the, what is the biggest company in the world today Mm -hmm, it's data mm -hmm. company that are bigger than the oil company today. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we are not teaching data or computer science in, in a traditional business schools today. So that's quite interesting. So that could become like a cross-cutting module, whatever you're studying. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, we are trying to, to find, I mean, we have to find both the example of the industry, the relevance of the industry, 
and we have to find teachers that are are skilled to teach in this area so it's finding them uh, or finding the topics and the cases that's that's the challenge at the moment Mm -hmm. that's all for this week thanks so much for listening in and huge thank you to all of my guests and salesforce.org for supporting you can continue the conversation online at hashtag edtechedge at podcast edtech and Salesforce Org on all the social medias. Or for all the show notes, including resource and reading recommendations, it's the edtechpodcast.com. We've also been loving this week the Philosophize This podcast. Uh, and we listened into a brilliant episode on the work of Hannah Arendt on the importance of having an active public life and why we can't truly understand ourselves by just thinking alone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.